Well, there's nothing better to rejoice about, to sing songs of joy about, to give our hearts to than the good news that Jesus Christ has come as Savior, that we, that though we wrecked ourselves, God has come to rescue us. This is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ has come as Savior. We're going to open up God's Word together, and we're going to be in John chapter 10. If you uh, brought your Bible, you can open to John chapter 10. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's usually one in about every third chair or so in the, the chairs behind you or in front of you. And the Gospel of John's in the New Testament. The New Testament starts with four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, then Luke, and then John. And we're going to be in John chapter 10. The title for the sermon comes right out of verse 20 of John chapter 10. Jesus is speaking this whole kind of message to them, this little sermon to them in verses 1 through 18 of John 10. And then verse 19 says that everybody kind of freaked out and there was a division because of his words. And then verse 20 says, many of them said he has a demon and is insane. And the last four words of verse 20 form the title for this sermon. Why listen to him? Why listen to him? I want to read this text together. Let's pray. Ask God to help us. Even now, Lord, let my heart be filled with joy. Even now, in this moment of preaching, Lord, let my heart be filled with love. Let my spirit be filled with zeal. Let my words be filled with wisdom so that you may be glorified so that we may see and hear Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, he says there in verse 10. Christmas and life. Jesus came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Then he goes on in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and he runs away. He flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so they will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. 
No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? In response to Jesus' message, they ask a great question in verse 20. Why listen to him? I hope you're here this morning and you're willing to ask that same question. Well, the fact that you're here, especially on a snowy morning, shows that you're at least sort of willing to wonder if Jesus is or isn't worth listening to. Why listen to him? Sometimes a lot is at stake if we listen or if we refuse to listen. On the other hand, there are a lot of messages that are coming at us all the time that don't mean anything and we're free to ignore them. What month do the advertisers spend the bulk of their advertising budget? It's always in December. If you, uh, like I did, um, Googled a particular gift that you were gonna buy for somebody, it's amazing, uh, it's, uh, it's astonishing how right after you Google a certain thing, then you'll start getting advertisements, emails, spam about that particular thing because of marketing analytics and data mining and all that. And the, 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 these ads just come at us and it's best to just ignore them. But did you know there are some things, some messages that you ignore at your peril? And in fact, the, in fact, what I believe about the word of God and the gospel is that you, you basically get the gospel when finally, at one moment in your life, you realize that there is one voice worth listening to more than your own internal voice. I believe that's the moment when through the miracle of conversion, you bow the knee of the heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you finally say to Jesus, what you say about me, it means more than what I've been busy saying about myself. We ask this question, why listen to Jesus? Is he worth listening to? I believe this text in John chapter 10 answers that question with two clear and straightforward reasons. Why listen to him? First reason, he laid down his life for us with sacrificial love. That's the first reason why we would listen to Jesus. The reason is because he laid down his life for us with sacrificial love. He laid down his life for us with sacrificial love. We see this reason in verse 11. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This reason that he laid down his life for us with sacrificial love is so the point of this passage that it's actually mentioned five times in here. I read it to you in verse 11. You see it in verse 15. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. You see it in verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life. And then you see it twice in verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Nothing is more central to the mission of Christmas than that Jesus laid down his life for us. Christmas and life means that we can have life because Jesus came to lay down his life for us. This is why Jesus can say um, with total truthfulness, I am the good shepherd. Jesus gives, if you see it there in verses 11 and 12 and 13, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd by way of contrast with the bad shepherd. He explains in those verses what a bad shepherd does. The bad shepherd sees the wolf coming in verse 12 and leaves the sheep and runs away. 
and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The hired hand sees the wolf and he sees the, the teeth of the wolf bared. And the bad shepherd sees those teeth, contemplates what's going to happen to me if that wolf bites me and runs away because he does not care about the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd because I took on flesh and put blood in my veins so that the wolf could devour me instead of the sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd because of how much he cares for the sheep. You see it there, and, and he, he says that the, the, the bad shepherd does not care for the sheep. Jesus cares. When no one else cares about you, it's kind of really depressing how many times I get to talk to somebody who actually says to me, nobody cares about me. So many of you feel that way. And when you feel like nobody cares about you, Jesus cares. So many of us have been wrongly abandoned by marriage partner, by family, or by friends. Because this world is kind of, it's kind of cutthroat and it's kind of competitive. And the people around us tend to say, as, as long as you have something to offer me, I'll care about you. As long as you have something to give back to me, I'll care about you. Jesus, Jesus says, I don't care what you have to offer me. I care about you. This divine one way love that comes right from the heart of Jesus. So unlike merely human love, it's divine love in human form. When Jesus says, you have nothing to offer me, but I'm not giving up. I'm offering myself to you. Jesus does whatever it takes to get through to us and there's no way of stopping his love. He laid down his life for us in sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is the point of this and him laying down his life for us is the point of this. The gift of life at Christmas is about two basic exchanges. The exchange of the incarnation and the exchange of substitution on the cross. The exchange of the incarnation is that Jesus gave up the riches of heaven for the poverty of earth. Jesus gave up his perfect spiritual existence in heaven to take on a body and blood down here on earth. The exchange of the incarnation, which sets up the second important exchange, the exchange of substitution on the cross. We call it substitutionary atonement. And atonement means a price being paid. The substitutionary atonement, where all of our sin, all of our sin was placed on that body. All of our sin was covered by that blood. So that at the cross, God and man meet and are reconciled in the sacrifice of the man who is God. This is salvation in operation. And I want you to see how, what a big deal that, John, that Jesus makes about that here in John chapter 10 because it's pretty easy to get along with the vibe that Jesus is loving and compassionate. I turned on my TV yesterday and I hit the, like the digital guide to see what was on. And every year at Christmas, multiple channels that really never say anything about Jesus. They have these Christmas specials or National Geographic has a special about Jesus. What was he really like and what did he really say and all this kind of thing. The, the, the sort of cultural vibe about Jesus, which isn't really wrong, is that Jesus was all about compassion and mercy. And when you read the Gospels, you see that. that that's very true. 
Open up any gospel and you'll find a vignette after vignette, little story after little story of a needy person with nothing and Jesus coming along and giving them everything. This is what Jesus does. But all of the compassion and mercy, this is where our culture fails to make the jump. All of the compassion and mercy that Jesus gives to the poor and to the needy is to set up the ultimate expression of compassion and mercy, which is the pouring out of his blood in substitutionary atonement. That's what it's all about, and that's what it all leads to. You see how Jesus talks about it in verse 17. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Dying in blood on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. This is the difference between what our world kind of understands and what you have to really believe to be a Christian. This is the difference, if I could put it this way, between the crucifixion and the cross. The crucifixion is what the Romans did to Jesus. They uh, martyred him or they executed him as a criminal. The cross is what God the Father did to God the Son. Because all the blood of all the bulls and lambs on all the altars slain could never pay the price that God chose to pay for our sin. The cross is what Jesus did, what all the prophecies foretold. This is why we should listen to him. So the answer to the question is, okay, so why should I listen to Jesus? Because in Jesus, you have someone, the only one, who will take every sin, every failure, everything that makes you ashamed and everything that makes you not belong with a God like God in a home like heaven and he will take that all away. Why wouldn't you listen to him? We should listen to Jesus because he loves us with a sacrificial love. And John chapter 10 gives us a second reason why we should listen to Jesus, though it's really just another way of saying the same reason. The second reason is this. He knows us and wants us with a relational love. He knows us and wants us with a relational love. And this is pointed out in so many places in John 10, I can't even, I, I can't even take the time to reread them all. Every place in here where you hear Jesus saying, they hear my voice, they hear my voice. Every, every place in here where you hear Jesus saying, I know them, I know them, and they know me. This is Jesus saying that he loves us, that, that, that he knows us, and that he wants us with a relational love. You see it there in verses 14 and 15. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is not distant. Every, every song that we already sang in this worship service has exploded the myth that God is distant. Because every hymn that we sang, every Christmas chorus that we sang said God came down to be with us, to win us. Jesus is not removed. Jesus is intimate and understanding. He says that he knows us. In verse 17, he says the Father loves him because he lays down his life that he may save us. I'm sort of moved by... The middle of verse 16, did you see that? In verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. I'm so moved by the two words in the very middle of verse 16. Jesus says, I must. I must. Jesus looks at those who are straying, those who are lost, and he doesn't say, maybe they'll get it, maybe they won't. 
he says, I. The eternal I am says, I must get them. I must save them. I must reach them. I must find them. This is his love for us. He must come and get us. And as moved as I am by verse 16, I think, if, if, if I could say this, the most astonishing piece of grammar in this entire paragraph is the first two words in verse 15. In the ESV translation, the first two words of verse 15. One four-letter word, just, and one two-letter comparative word, as. Just as there in verse 15. Look at how mind-blowing that is by backing it up and then freighting it forward. Look at, look at how that, that lands in the grammar of the text. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. I want my own with relational love and they're going to want to love me with relational love just as, this is what he compares it to, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. This is astonishing. The relational love that Jesus died to have with us, the relational love that motivated Jesus to die for us is just as the love that God the Father has for God the Son. So that enables us to say from John chapter 10 that ultimate love came down to this world of alienation and loneliness. That ultimate love came down to rescue us to a world where, where we have such need. This enables me that, that just as in verse 15 enables me to tell you this. It is my astonishing privilege to tell you this. Ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. Ultimate reality beyond everything else is not just the stuff that we see. Ultimate reality is not death and taxes. Ultimate reality is not that I'm stuck in a freezing church while my mom goes to church where it's 70 degrees. Ultimate reality is not all these things that we tell ourselves or complain about. I can tell you based on the word of God here in John 10, what he says there in verse 15 that for us, ultimate reality is love. Because before the world was ever created, God the Father loved God the Son. Love predates the world. God's love for you predates your existence. The ultimate reality is not just how you have experienced or failed to experience love in the 20, 60, 70 years that is your life. Ultimate reality before the world ever was is love. God the Father's love for God the Son. And God the Father loved God the Son so much. And God the Son loved God the Father so much that they decided this love is to be shared with the whole world. And this pushes and motivates the wave that crashes upon us in life and love at Christmas. This is the message of God's love. That though we wrecked ourselves and ran away from him, God the Father said to his son, I love you so much. I want those lost ones to be in on this love. So Jesus Christ, the second member of the eternal trinity, took on my flesh, your flesh, my blood, your blood, so that he could come down and reach us. Why listen to him? Why listen to him? One who has loved you with that kind of eternal love. How could you listen to anyone else? Let's pray.
present Spirit of God, in this moment, we invite you to do your work in our hearts. Living Spirit of God, in this moment, we invite you to be at work in us. Bring conviction, bring conversion, bring communion with Christ. Oh, help us to listen. And listening, help us to soften. And being softened, help us to change and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.